We are in uh, Parashat Chukat, and uh, in this week's parasha, even though the, the theme is about the red heifer, there is another uh, serious story going on, a very dramatic story at, uh, in this parasha. And this, of course, is talking about the time when Moshe Rabbeinu hit the rock for the water. In Hebrew, it's called Mei Meriva, the water of affliction, the water of uh, the argument. And uh, like I said, the theme of the parasha is about the red heifer, but nevertheless, a few other serious things happen there. And this is a pretty, pretty big thing in the Torah, because Moshe Rabbeinu, our leader, uh, the receiver and the giver of the Torah, our master, uh, he makes a wrong decision. He makes a wrong decision and he hits the rock instead of talking to the rock. And uh, this is the time when the Kadosh Bukhu tells him, you have brought on yourself your own decree. And the decree is that uh, he's not going into Israel. That was the punishment. Now, first of all, just in regards to Moshe Rabbeinu, comes, of course, a very big question. What did he do? He hit the rock. It's not that he did some, something so bad. What did he do? So he didn't talk to it. He hit it. Such a punishment not to go into Eretz Israel. He dedicatedly took the Jews out of Egypt, led them in the desert, and suffered their complaints for 40 years and did an amazing job and that's it one little smack to the rock and he gets punished not to go into Eretz Israel that's a that's a pretty harsh uh, punishment but in regards to us what do we take from that that our perfect leader made a wrong decision made a wrong mistake made a mistake how do we relate to such a thing that our uh, master up until today that's his uh, that's his uh, Nickname, Moshe Rabbeinu. He's our master, he's our teacher. We don't call him Moshe the king. Moshe was a king. We don't call, we call David a melech, Shlomo a melech. We don't call Moshe a king. We don't call him Moshe Avinu. We call Abraham Avinu. Uh, we, there's many titles that he can get. We don't call him Moshe the prophet. We call uh, Shmuel is the prophet. Shmuel a Navi, Eliyahu a Navi. Moshe got the title Rabbeinu, our teacher our teacher and our master. What do we take from that? That he made a wrong decision and what was the wrong decision? To hit the rock? So we want to see why the, the Torah is teaching us this story. The Torah is not a histor history book. It's not to tell me historical facts. Uh, in fact, the Torah is not telling me historical facts. We have for that different books that are giving me the history of the Torah. Uh, on Shabbat there was a very interesting guest here that he is not official, but his uh, uh, passion to the Torah is the geography of the Torah. And he does a lot, a lot of research in regards to the geography. And he told me some so such interesting information in the morning that he does a lot, a lot of research. And really when you're thinking about it, there's a whole geography in the Torah where they entered the land, where everything was positioned, how everything was positioned. Is it really what we think? After all, we're talking about 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Do we really know exactly where everything happened? And he found so much amazing information. I don't think you have to publish it. So now it's, I think it's now in the stages to really find solid proof that it's not going to be contradicted. But he found different information uh, exactly where's the, the round rock that Yaakov, remember the rock that Yaakov moved? According to his calculations and research, it's here, here in, the, in the Galil, in the, in the Golan, right over here. According to his calculations, it's really in, 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 in Meron. And in Meron, there is, a, there is a, a, a rock there. I don't know if you ever saw, next to the grave of Shammai, there's a round, huge round rock. But nevertheless, he came with this unbelievable information with sources and everything. It's just interesting to think the geography of the Torah. So there's also the history of the Torah. So we're learning here not the history of the Torah. Here we're learning more facts of the Torah, but more a lesson, because the Torah comes from the word in Hebrew, Hora'ah. Hora'ah is to teach. So the Torah is coming to teach me something that obviously 
when the Torah chose from thousands of stories to tell me specific stories, must be that, that each story has a profound message for me to take, so that way I know how to lead my life. If I want to reach to my goal, then I have to first of all set a goal, but then I need the right path to go on. Because even if I have a goal, but I don't know the path to walk on, I will never reach there. Or if I'll reach there, it will take years and years, and challenges and a lot of failures. The Torah is the spiritual GPS that lies down the, the, the route. Turn right, turn left, go straight, go up. So a smart person says, if I don't have a destination, I will never reach anywhere. If I have a destination, but I don't know the route, what good is the destination? I need to have a destination, and I need to have a route for that. And the Torah is the power that leads me, gives me the route. So obviously, when the Torah chooses a story, there's something for me to take from it, and if I know how to apply it in my life, then I hit the jackpot. And if not, then I'm wasting my time. Now, so comes this story, and uh, again, it's telling me that Moshe Rabbeinu, the idol, so to say, chas v'shalom, should not even use that word, but here's the example, <coughs> that up until today, we never had a leader like Moshe Rabbeinu. He was never replaced. And we, and, and, and we put him on a pedestal, it's our master. That up until today, everything is funneled back to him. When we want to talk about a halakha, we, we, we will backtrack it up to Moshe Rabbeinu. Nevertheless, the guy makes the wrong decision, a quick, a quick uh, impulse act, and now he gets punished for that. So first we have to understand a little bit, a little bit the background, a little bit the history. So, we know there's a story in the Talmud about a certain uh, rabbi known as Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was a very unique individual. He wrote the Oral Torah. He took all the Oral Torah and wrote it down into Mishnayot. Not only that, he was the head of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Supreme Court. He was the head of the Sanhedrin. Just, uh, just to understand uh, the level of the individual. Nevertheless, there is a story in the Gemara that one time he sits with his students, it was a nice day, they sat outside on the, on the grass to learn, not like us in a freezing air conditioning. Sat outside, it was a beautiful day, they were sitting on the grass, and as they're talking, a little uh, calf runs out, and he runs towards uh, Rabbi Yudanasi, and he whoop, comes under his coat, and he puts his head under the coat. Okay, so... Rabbi Yudanasi obviously understood this is a calf that ran out of the slaughterhouse. The calf probably saw the shochet, saw all the blood, and was like, okay, I'm going to be, be ch uh, the hamburger tonight. So he ran away. So the story says that Rabbi Yudanasi understood that he ran away from the shochet. And you know what he told him? Go back. Go back to the slaughterhouse because that's what you were created for. That uh, is not sensitive. The poor calf ran to you. He put his head in his uh, jacket. Hide me, I'm afraid. You would expect from such a leader to calm the calf down, maybe hold him for a few moments, feed him, and, and then take him nicely to the slaughterhouse. But very, in a very cold way, he says, no, go back. You were, that's what you were created for. The Kadosh Baruch is very particular with Tzadikim. It says that the Kadosh Baruch is particular with the righteous people, Kechut as, HaSeara, as length, the, the width of a hair. Which means that if a person is in a very high level, one little mistake, Kadosh Baruch already is like the, the judgment is very severe. Why? Because you're in a very high level. So, from Shamaim there was a decree against what he did. They said, you're not showing any humanity here. You're not showing any sensitivity here. Even if it's a calf, and they, he got punished. And for 13 years, he was severely punished. 13 years, he, he had very bad years. Very tough 13 years. And the Talmud says he was suffering from t terrible toothache, teeth pain, and from uh, stones in his kidneys. Two things that the pain is very, very harsh. And bear in mind, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have Motrin or Advil or all these uh, chemicals to numb the nerves. They maybe had other things to, to make the pain go away, but for 13 years he was going through suffering. One day, after 13 years, he's uh, sitting in, in his home and learning, and there's a cleaning lady there, cleaning the place. 
Suddenly she sees a little rat, a rat, a mouse, comes out from the, one of the cracks in the wall. She takes a stick and she's about to smash the rat. He tells her, no, 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 stop, stop, don't, don't, don't do anything to the rat. He says, uh, quotes a verse from Tehilim, V'rachamav al kol ma'asav, and his mercy is on all his creatures, just scare it out, don't, don't kill it. Don't need to kill it, he didn't do anything to you. Then they saw from Shemaim that he figured it out, and they stopped. They said, okay, he had enough suffering. And the 13 years of bad, 13 years, uh, was uh, finished. The Gemara teaches us from this story that a person dis di puts on himself his own decree. You decide what's going to be your own fate. It's not decided from above. Rather, you decide your own fate based on your behavior, based on your judgment, based on your, your uh, 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 speech and actions and so forth. So if this is the case, we're going back to our question for this class. What did Moshe Rabbeinu did that he deserved a punishment not to go into Eretz Israel? Such a dedicated leader, such a dedicated servant. He did above and beyond. One day he hits the rock and that's it. The punishment is not to go into Eretz Israel. Why? So first let's understand what was going on exactly at the time. This story happened at the end of the 40 years. That's where you see that the Torah doesn't have necessarily a sequence or an order. Because the spies that we learned two weeks ago in Parashat Shlach Lecha, that happened a year and three months after they left Egypt. They left in, in Sivan. They left Mitzrayim in Nisan. And then in the end of Sivan, Kaftet Sivan, they left, came back and Tisha B'Av, we know exactly when it happened. About a year, three, four months after leaving Mitzrayim. The story with Korach happened right after that. So we have an idea. Now the Torah jumps 40 years forward and the story with the rock happens mamash at the end of the 40 years. Now the story goes that in the head of the month of Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, Miriam dies. Miriam is Moshe and Aaron's sister. She was a prophet and she dies on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Moshe and Aaron are devastated. That's her sister. Not only that sister sister, they were a powerhouse together. Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam, they were complementing each other. They were mamash together, a powerhouse. All three prophets, all three with a, with a, with a huge shlichut, a huge mission to lead the generation. Aaron is the Kohen Gadol. Miriam is in charge of the women. Moshe is the leader. He teaches the Torah, together they're running the show. Suddenly Miriam dies. They go into the tent and they start crying, they mourn, they're upset. And they hear a commotion, huge commotion. Moshe Rabbeinu goes out of the tent and he sees people screaming and, and, and a whole um, balagan going on, like a demonstration. What's going on? Well, well relax. Can we mourn the death of our sister? And they're all telling them, listen, we have bad news. The rock, it disappeared. Miriam's well, where is it? The, the story was that in the merit of Miriam, she guarded Moshe next to the water for three months. So in her merit, the, there was a rock that gave out water. Can you imagine? Millions of people, 40 years in the desert. They don't have faucets. But where's the water coming from? There was a rock. They all came with their pitchers, fill it up, they all had water. This is called Miriam's well, the Be'er Miriam. That's why our institute is called Be'er Miriam. This is the, the well of, wellspring of knowledge, of Torah, of sustenance. Nevertheless, they said, listen, we have a bad news. The rock disappeared. We don't find it. There's no water. Oh, relax. Two hours without water. What's the big deal? What, you don't think Hashem can take care of you? Two hours, we can't, you can't let us mourn the death of our sister. Two hours later, you're all freaking out because you don't have water. Hold your horses. Nevertheless, the people are freaking out. They're losing it. We don't have water. What are we going to do? Then everybody's upset at Moshe, of course. What did I do? I didn't do anything. So they all come to Moshe and they're upset of him. So, and they're all upset. There's no rock. How are we going to drink now? What are we going to do? So Moshe Rabbeinu, as usual, turns around, asks Hashem, what do you want me to do? There's no water here. What should I do? Hashem tells him, go find the rock and talk to it. 
say a few words that I'm going to tell you to say, some holy words, and the water will come out again. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to sanctify me in front of the nation. Because you're going to find the rock, you're going to, Moshe Rabbeinu did everything with his mouth. I mentioned that in one of the classes, the previous classes, Moshe Rabbeinu had a staff. People think the staff is a piece of wood. And Moshe Rabbeinu was this uh, nine-year-old guy with Parkinson that's uh, shaking. Moshe Rabbeinu was a powerful guy, was a big guy, and his staff made out of sapphire. It wasn't a wood, wooden staff. It was made out of pure sapphire and it was in the shape of a cube. If you would turn the, the staff this way, it was like a square. And every part of the staff was, had four corners, had all the holy names of Hashem, all the names of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And Moshe Rabbeinu would look at the staff, read a combination of names of Hashem, and something would happen. He did everything with his mouth. When he wanted to kill the Egyptian, he said a few holy names, the Egyptian died. He said a few holy names, the Egyptian got buried in the sand. When he wanted to open the, the sea to bring down the, the man, everything he did with his mouth. Next week we're going to read the parasha of Balak. Balak is, when there is a king that they saw the nation of Israel coming closer. He got scared. He went to a sorcerer called Bilam. And he says, listen, this uh, these nation is going to come to get us. They're already destroying everything in their way. Let's uh, do some preventive medicine here. Let's see if we can attack them. And Bilam says, listen, you can't fight them because their power is in their mouth. And this is, didn't change up until today. Our power is our mouth, it's not, it's not our hands. It's not our hands, it's not our uh, jets. Our power is only in our mouth. And this applies to us as a nation and applies to us as an individual. Our mouth is so powerful that my mouth can destroy worlds and my mouth can build worlds. And my power of prayer and uh, Torah or chas v'shalom, curses and lies and lashon hara can be devastating or unbelievable and credible. Moshe Rabbeinu, his power was in his mouth. So the staff had all the holy names of Hashem and Hashem told him, you're going to find the rock, you're going to say a few names and water will come out and you're going to sanctify me in front of everybody. Okay. Now Moshe starts looking for the rock. Starts looking around, where is the rock? Where did it go? And looking around for it. And he finds one rock, finds another rock. Okay, he finds the first rock and he whispers what he's supposed to say. Nothing comes up. There's a group of people behind him and they uh, say, what's going on here? What, Moshe Rabbeinu is lying to us. He's tricking us. And they start talking bad about, about him and he listens to that. And at this point, Moshe Rabbeinu loses his patience and he turns around and he gets upset at them and he curses them. The first time after 40 years of being such a, a good and loyal, loyal leader, he loses it. He literally loses it and he curses them. And he tells them, Shimu na hamorim. Listen to me, you rebels. You, you, you uh, uh, I don't know really the, the word in English to hamorim. It's kind of like rebels. You're going against me. Uh, 40 years I'm tolerating your nonsense. How dare you talk to me like this? And he lets it out. He gets upset at them. And needless to say, that from the anger, he takes his staff and he hits the rock and then water comes out. And right away, Kadosh Baruch comes and says, I'm sorry to tell you, this is not appropriate that you lose it. This is not appropriate for the leader to get upset and to curse the people. Therefore, you and your brother will not go into Eretz Israel. <laughs> now Moshe Rabbeinu is getting this devastating news. And of course, well, what did he do? So he hit the rock, big deal. It's not that he did something so big. Why is he getting punished in such a thing? And not only that, the Kadosh Baruch said, I wanted you to sanctify my name. He still got water out of the rock. That's a pretty big miracle. It's not that they didn't do a, a, a miracle. It's still a miracle that the water came out of the rock. Nevertheless, this is the decree. This is the punishment. Moshe and Aaron are not going into Eretz Israel, which of course, like we mentioned, then we don't understand. In the beginning, uh, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu talked to the rock. It just was the wrong one. But what do you want from him? He, you know, all the rocks look the same. He talks to the first rock and it didn't work. Now, we mentioned that there's a commentary, Yonatan Aipschitz, who asks, why did Moshe Rabbeinu take the staff? The Torah says very clearly, Kachet matcha, take your staff in your hand and then go talk to the rock. So why do you need, if Hashem didn't want Moshe to hit the rock, 
Why did you send him with the staff? Tell him, leave the staff at home and go and talk to the rock. That's uh, maybe there's some type of a conspiracy here. Why are you telling him to take the, the staff? But more than that, Moshe Rabbeinu hits the rock and still water comes out. That's still a huge miracle. Well, why, why, why are you so harsh on uh, Moshe Rabbeinu? He still did a miracle. Comes a commentary, Rabbi Yitzchak Arama, and he says something very interesting. He says, here we have a table, here we have a piece of meat, here we have a knife, but we don't have a mouth to eat it. So we have all the information in front of us, but we don't have a mouth to digest, to, to, to chew on. So we have all the information, but we can't find an explanation to why Moshe Rabbeinu go, got punished in such a way. Don't even try. Comes a different commentary, the Abarbanel and says, no. He gathers 10 different uh, 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 commentaries of other commentaries, explanations why Moshe Rabbeinu got punished like that, and he disqualifies all ten. And the Rabbanel comes and says, I have an explanation why Moshe Rabbeinu got punished so harsh. And he says, the sin of hitting the rock, that's not the sin. That's a cover-up. That's an a, a excuse. There was other sins. There, there, there were other th big sins that Moshe and Aaron did, uh, the Torah doesn't want to mention it and therefore this is the, the, the Torah took another sin a small one and says okay that's the that's going to be the sin you know it's a similar story with Adam Arishon Adam Arishon Adam he we know that he did a few sins he he ate from the tree of knowledge and we also know that he did three major sins that were repeated later on in the first temple Adam Arishon failed in idol worship, in forbidden relations, and bloodshed. The three sins that the nation of Israel failed at the time of the Holy Temple, the first temple. So that's already four sins. Nevertheless, we learn from the Zohar that Adam Arishon had many more sins. Just that Adam Arishon literally begged Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and says, Please do not reveal my sins in your book. So we know that Adam Arishon also had other sins. So same thing here, the Abar Manan says, Moshe and Haron had more sins. Just the Torah did not want to chas v'shalom hurt them in any way, so it doesn't talk about it. So the, the Torah takes the sin of hitting on the, on the rock and says, oh, that's the sin. But really that's not the sin. Now we asked before, what are the sins? Why why Aaron was the one also getting punished? And Aaron Cohen, he did the golden calf. Even though we explained it already, that he didn't mean to, it was a way of stalling, he wanted to try to save the situation, he was trying to, to get out of it, he was forced, he was threatened, but nevertheless, he physically took the gold and threw it in the, in the, in the fire, so he's have a partnership in the sin, and this is a severe sin. And Moshe Rabbeinu, what are the sins that he do? Last week, we read about the sin of the, of the spies. Moshe Rabbeinu sent them, Hashem says, I'm, I'm not telling you to send them, Moshe Rabbeinu should have understood from that, wait a minute, wait a minute, if Hashem is not ordering me to do that, I should think two steps ahead and say, no, I'm sorry to tell you, no, there's not going to be any spies. But nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu still sends, sends the spies into Israel. In any, in any event, we can't take the, the, the what we say, Mikrami de Pshuto, we can't take the script out of its actual uh, uh, meaning. There is a sin here, even with hitting the, 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 the rock is a sin. Now, there is a story to understand that a little bit more clear. There's a story in Tanakh about Shaul HaMelech. This story can be found in the book of Shmuel. And uh, the story says that David HaMelech, David HaMelech lived in the house of Shaul. Shaul was the king and David HaMelech was, uh, was living there. And uh, at some point, David, um, uh, Shaul figured out that David is uh, going to be a problem. He understood that he's going to take over, that he's going to be the king. And Shaul started to develop anger and animosity and jealousy. He didn't like him. But nevertheless, the son of Shaul, Yonatan, was best friends with David Amelech. And uh, it, of course, caused uh, some conflict. Now at some point, David the Melech, he wasn't the king yet, but he felt that Shaul is not 100% happy anymore. 
you know, we all experience such things that you staying as a guest by somebody and you know you outdid your visit. And uh, nevertheless, David the Melech started feeling, okay, Shaul is not so happy with my presence here. What does David da does? He goes to his best friend, Yonatan. He says, can you ask uh, by your father, what's the status here? That I'm not going to wake up one day with a sword on my throat? So, of course, it's a very sensitive situation. After all, this is Yonatan is the son of Shaul. And David the Melech is his best friend. So, there was one time a, a, a feast for Rosh Chodesh. And David the Melech didn't, David the Melech didn't show up. And the chair was empty. So Yonatan saw that as an opportunity. And of course, Shaul comes and uh, tells Yonatan, where's uh, Ben Ishai? Where's David? David? So he says, listen, he went to eat the meal in his family house. No big deal. Didn't do anything. He, instead of eating with us, he went to eat it with his family. And Shaul, of course, gets upset. And and starts an argument between Jonathan and Shaul. Jonathan is trying to defend David, Shaul is trying to attack, and Shaul gets upset and he tells Jonathan, um, you know, I, 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 you, do you realize that this man, David, is your rival? You have to be the king. If he takes over, he pushes you off. And they get into a, a whole argument. To a point, Shaul gets very upset, he pulls out his sword, and he's, uh, he's going like this, and he's about to hurt his own son. Luckily, Jonathan made a quick move, and the sword missed, and nothing happened. And we see from that, nevertheless, that later on, Shaul lost his, his uh, power. David Amelech was the one who became king. But we see here that anger causes us to do wrong decisions. And we see that we shall, we see it now with Moshe Rabbeinu, and we see it in our own life, that when we get angry, we don't do good decisions. If I need to make a decision, I have to be very calm. If I'm going to make a decision when I'm angry, it's going to be a very bad decision. And the Rambam says, in a very interesting way, that the Kadosh Baruch created us with a lot of faults, a lot of problems, mainly chisonot, faults, and uh, bad character traits. But there is one fault, one bad character trait that is a danger. I mean, you can be lazy, you can be judgmental, you can be a little bit messy, you can be late all the time. There's many things that are faults. But one thing, Rambam says, this fault is a danger, and that's anger. And this is, we all have anger. One person is more, one person is less, but we have to be realistic and we all suffer from different character traits that are negative. And I just mentioned mention a few. Ooh, there's a long list of bad uh, character traits. Uh, it can be jealous, can be judgmental, can be lazy, can be, ooh, so many things. But specifically, anger, this is a danger one. And Rambam says in the book, Moren Nebuchim, that that was the, the sin of Moshe Rabbeinu. Not the spies, not the hitting the rock, the anger, that he got angry. And the Rizal says, very, very interesting. It says in the Gemara that any person, a person that is angry is like doing idol worship. There's actually a few places in the Gemara that define how bad anger is. One place in the Talmud it says that any person that is, gets upset and angry, everything that he learned in the Torah, he forgets. He loses everything that he, that he learned. Uh, another place in the Talmud, it says that when a person is upset, he's like he's an idol worshiper. He's like serving other gods. And another place in the Talmud, it says that a person that is, gets upset, all the kol gehinam sholtimbo, he becomes a chariot to all the dem demons from Gehenom. He makes himself so vulnerable because of the anger that he becomes now a vessel through him Demons and spirits and all these evil entities from Genom can get dressed into that person and they control him. That's how bad it is. Then uh, Darizal explains that when a person is angry <coughs> and he loses his right uh, uh, common sense, when you're angry, you're not thinking clear, you're doing the worst sins. 
That's what happens when you, when you get angry, because you have zero control of, of yourself. The Rizal explains, based on the teachings of Kabbalah, the second that you are angry, your soul jumps out of the body, and a different soul comes in. And the different soul that comes in controls your body, and makes you do the whole, most horrible things. Now, with that said, so we see that the terrible sin that Moshe Rabbeinu did was anger. Now, interesting, it says, you know, a lot of people are very afraid of hell, hell, purgatory, or whatever you're going to call it, Gehenom. The commentary says that for all the sins that you do, you get punished for them in hell in the world to come, in the, in the spiritual world. But for anger, the Gehenom, the hell is in this world. Because you do a sin right now, you steal, you cheat, you steal a shonara. If you didn't do tshuva, there's going to be uh, an account for that. Where in Gehenom? Gehenom is the, is the judging place. That's where you get cleansed. But if you get angry, the Gehenom, the hell, is in this world. Because when you're angry, you get your stomach ache, you don't, get, you don't fall asleep, you don't digest. Uh, things don't work out because you're upset, you swear, you curse, you push, you shove. So you suffer from the result in this world. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a joke. I told you once this joke. I'm sure you don't remember and some of you weren't attending the class. But there's a joke. There was a truck driver. And he used to drive, you know, those cement trucks. The trucks that they, uh, they have like a bowl in the back. And they mix the cement and then they go and pour the cement. <coughs> it was a driver. And he worked very hard, 30, 40 years, used to drive the truck from 3 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. He worked hard. And he had a dream <clears throat> that one day he's going to buy a Mercedes. That was his dream. I'm going to work for 40 years, just one day to buy a Mercedes. And, and he was a little bit of a hothead, he had upset all the time. One day he comes home and he's trying to find parking to the truck. Goes around and around and around and he looking for parking and then he comes to the place where he's the parking for his truck and he's upset he had a long day he's driving for 24 hours he's restless he's not sleeping he's upset he's angry he's coming to park his truck he comes to the place where the parking is and what does he find somebody parked in his spot oh the blood now going to his head is freaking out how dare somebody park in my parking spot and more than that nothing but a mercedes he gets so upset he backs up turns the truck around now he's backing up with the truck he opens that wing and he lets all the cement out on the mercedes <clears throat> covers it with cement and then he goes far far away and he parks somewhere else he's so pissed off he's so upset he's angry he's he walks into this home, to his home, suddenly he sees about 50 people screaming, Surprise! Happy birthday! And they hand him a car keys of a Mercedes. So the anger, his own anger, he covered his own Mercedes with the, with the, with the cement. This is a joke, of course, but nevertheless, the Gemara, the Talmud says, a person who's an angry person, is called Ka'asan, he will always remain with one thing, his own anger. Everything else you lose. Everything else you lose with anger, the only thing that you stay with is your own anger. And did you solve the problem? No. The problem will still be there. Anger does not solve the problem. Now, comes a beautiful explanation by another commentary. Uh, it's it, it found in the, in the Evan Ezra. And also can be found the same commentary in another commentary called the Orachim. There is a commentary, he's known as the Shadal, that's the acronym. His, rabbi, his, his name is Shmuel David Luzzato. He's a commentary, he used to live in Italy. And he says, the Shadal, the, the Shmuel David Luzzato, that there are 13 explanations to the sin of Moshe Rabbeinu. 13 explanations. But nevertheless, there is one commentary, three commentaries, brought by the Eben Ezra, and one of them can be found also by the, the Or Chaim. And he, they said the problem of Moshe Rabbeinu was the curse. Not the anger, not the hitting, not the, not the Kiddush Hashem, the curse, that he cursed. Because he said to the nation, Shinu, Shimu na hamorim. Listen to me, you rebels. He cursed them. 
Now, the commentary says, if you curse the nation that you're supposed to lead, then I'm sorry, you can't lead them anymore. That's where you got fired. Because for 40 years, you, you tolerated them. So you are a worthy leader. The second that you open your mouth and you curse them, then how can you be the leader of your own nation? Therefore, right away, we have to hire a new leader. That's right away when Moshe Rabbeinu got punished and a new leader came in, which was Shaul, which was Yoshua, of course. And the same thing with Shaul, the same way, the second he lost his anger, he wasn't worthy to be the leader. Now, the problem was that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't believe in the nation. He loved them. He, he, was, he loved the nation. He protected them. He was willing to be uprooted from the Sefer Torah just for them not to be destroyed. He loved them. He cared for them, but he didn't believe in them. And this is where we see an unbelievable connection between Moshe Rabbeinu and Eliyahu the prophet, Eliyahu Navi. You know that we know that every time there's a Brit Milah, who comes to visit? Eliyahu Navi. Do you know why he comes to the Brit Milah? Everybody knows that Eliyahu comes to the Brit Milah, but nobody knows why. So, of course, there is a verse in the Torah that can be found in the parasha that we're going to be reading in two weeks, parasha Pinchas. This can be found in chapter 25 in the book of Bamidbar. And it says there, Hineni noten lo it shalom. I hereby give him my covenant of peace. So, this is a simple explanation why Eliyahu comes to the Brit. Because Hashem gave him the Brit, the Brit of peace. But, there's a more deeper reason why Eliyahu Navi goes to every Brit Milah. Eliyahu Navi, at the end of his uh, term, he was a prophet, he uh, kind of, uh, his spirit was, got broken. Uh, he was prosecuted, everybody was going after him, there was a certain uh, individual, Achav went against him, Izevil went against him, everybody went against him. Everybody wanted him down. And he was uh, prosecuted, everybody was uh, bad-mouthing him, his spirit got broken. And he went uh, to the field and he went and told, he bad-mouthed the nation of Israel to Hashem. And he said to Hashem, look at this nation, they deserted you, they went against you. Hashem didn't like this comment of Eliyahu Navi and says, really? You're saying that this nation went against me? No. First of all, you are not worthy anymore to be the leader of the generation. And of course, will come a different leader who was Elisha. And he will replace you. That's it. You're fired, in other words. If you talk bad about my nation, sorry to tell you, you can't be the leader anymore. But more than that, first of all, we know that Elisha came and replaced him. But more than that, Hashem told him, just because you didn't have faith in the nation and you said, look how they went against you, they deserted you, I'm going to kind of punish you and I'm going to show you how strong the nation of Israel, how they're so attached to me, how they're willing to go in fire and hell for me. And you are going to go now for all generations to the Brit Milah of every child and you'll see what's Mesirut Nefesh. You're going to see how that nation never left me and they will never leave me. 3,000 years later, they'll still do Brit Milah to their kids. Parents, they're not even observant. They don't even follow the Torah. Comes a child, they circumcise the child on eight days, which seems like a very, very barbaric ritual and you're hurting the child. So Hashem told Eliyahu Navi, you think that they deserted me? That they let go? I'm going to show you that they never let go. And you're going to have to go now to every breed, and that's going to be the proof that you're going to see. You see, they remembered me. You see, they didn't leave me. You see, they still follow what I tell them. I said, go and cut a piece of the flesh of a child, an eight-day-old child. They'll do it till the end of time. And that's for, it's, it's interpreted as a punishment, but Leonovi has to come now to every breed, and every time that he comes to the breed, Shem says, you see, they didn't desert me. They didn't get it go against me. They still follow what I tell them 2,000 years later. So we see here that, that Moshe Rabbeinu and Eliyahu Navi kind of share the same thing. They were leaders, they were prophets. But nevertheless, as much as they loved the nation, they didn't really believe in them. And uh, therefore, one can explain that the sin was the anger of Moshe Rabbeinu. And like the Ebenezer and the Orachim says, no, the sin was that they didn't believe 
They didn't believe in the nation. They, they, the, so Moshe Rabbeinu cursed the nation. And if you believe in somebody, don't curse them. So how is that relating to us? What do we need to learn from that? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not a prophet and I'm definitely not Moshe Rabbeinu. And not Eliyahu Navi. But obviously the Torah is coming to teach me very two, very, two very powerful things here. One is that how devastating anger is. How one should run away from anger like fire. And when you're angry, don't make any decisions. Don't do anything when you're angry. You lose your temper, <clears throat> go to the room and relax. And that's why we've seen many times, somebody's angry, okay, let's talk about it tomorrow. No, I don't want to talk about it. When I was, uh, when I, before I was observant, I was Mr. Angry. And I was like, uh, my anger was not under, I was under, not under control. My poor parents, how many, how many things they broke in the house. There, there was a, a glass maker, how do you call the, the glass makers? Uh, uh, you know, the trade, the, the person is a, the change is glass. I had a door in my room that was made out of glass. I think I broke it maybe 50 times, I'm not exaggerating. Every time I get upset, I would kick, start breaking things. My, my doors had holes. And the glass maker, every time he would come, it was already a joke. He knew already the measurements. We would just call him, the glass is broken. Okay, I'm coming. And, <laughs> and I was, I, my anger was really out of control when I was young. If somebody would look at me the wrong way, that poor person, what would happen to him? I was like, if you would uh, go, and, go and Google, ro ro road rage would be my face. I was completely out of control. My friends used to call me Boompitom. Boom is a punch, and pitom is suddenly. So it wasn't like a preparation or a warm-up. I would lose it and straight away strike. So my anger was completely out of control. Why? It's not so important why. But I had to stop that when I became observant because it was completely out of control. But in, a, in, a, in an extreme, extreme way. And I didn't like it because I would get so angry that I would, uh, my, my brain would hurt me from the anger. And I would be sh shaking for, for hours from anger. Try to control it. Try, try to, no, I couldn't control the anger, but how it would affect my body was, it was scary. But nevertheless, I, I knew that when I have to make a decision on the anger, that's not a good decision. And, and, and it took me a long time to really know how to calm myself down that first of all, the first part of the, of the process was to not to talk or not to do anything when I'm angry, not to control the anger. Because to control the anger, this is a very difficult uh, uh, process. But not to say anything while I'm angry, like to, to know how to lock myself in a room. I'm angry right now, let's not talk now. <laughs> let's not talk for about 24 hours, then we'll talk when I'm relaxed. So, the point to take from here is how, how devastating is anger is, how dangerous it is. And we all have anger, each one to a certain extent. Some people it's completely out of control, some people it's a little bit out of control. But nevertheless, we all have anger in us. The simple message of here is when you're angry, don't do anything. Take a, take a break, go to the room, go outside, take some, uh, some water to drink, relax, relax yourself, don't talk, don't react, don't do anything. Because anything you're going to do while you're angry is going to be a destruction. So the first and most important message is that we really need to know how to control our anger. There are now it's not the time to start t teaching how to control anger. But I have to first realize when there's a problem. If I don't realize it's a problem, then I don't know how to fix it. Like we talked before, first you have to realize there's a problem. If I don't realize that I have a problem, then I will never do anything to fix it. So I need to come to terms to understand, who am I kidding? I have a problem with anger. You know, some people, they realize that they have a problem with alcohol. They go and take care of it, and then they go to the, to the meetings. And how do they start the meeting? Hello, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. So there are also uh, these meetings for anger. And my name is so-and-so, and I have a problem with anger. I can tell you only about myself. My anger was so out of control, it was already, it became a financial burden, because I would break things. I mean, I mean, Baruch Hashem, there wasn't iPhones at the time, because I would break my iPhone probably every two days. I would break everything that I had from anger. So the point is the first to realize that you have a problem. If you don't realize you have a problem, you're never going to do anything about it. 
But now we're just presenting the problem, we're not presenting the solution. The solution will have to come in part B of the class. But the first and most important lesson is that if Moshe Rabbeinu possessed some anger and it caused him not to go into Eretz Israel, I have to learn from that how devastating anger is and probably how many things I lost in my life because of anger. How many business deals didn't work out. How many whatever opportunities didn't work out because of my anger. So I need to understand that you don't make decisions over anger. Anger is, is a danger. When I am angry, do whatever you can to move away from your loved ones while you're angry. Go and close yourself in a room, bang your head at the wall, just don't let it out on other people. But another thing that we need to learn from that, and we see that both Moshe Rabbeinu and Eliyahu Navi, they suffered from that, is that as much as great as they had love to the nation, they didn't believe in the nation. And we also don't believe in other people, whether it's my kids, whether it's my spouse, whether it's my co-workers, whether it's other people. You can love a person to death, but we have to believe in other people. We have to know how to apply that, that I need to have confidence that my wife can do something, my husband, my co-workers, my kids. I have to know how to develop the emuna, the belief, to I believe in other people. Needless to say, to love other people. But I have to believe that each and every one of us has such potential in us. Now, if I don't believe in you, and he will not believe in you, and he will not believe, nobody believes in you, then you're not, you're not going to believe in yourself, and you're going to become a failure. If a child doesn't believe in himself, he's not going to become anything. So I have to know, so I have to believe in my kids, and I have to give them this power, because they develop the belief in themselves, and they, be, they, they become something. And it's not only my child. Like what we talked about before, if I have a, if my, have a spouse and my spouse seems to going through some type of a, a challenge, I need to believe in them that they'll be able to overpower it. If I don't believe in them, they'll never overpower it. So we as humans, as parents, as siblings, as, as children, as educators, doesn't matter. I have to believe in other people and give them that feeling. Because everybody is possessing this unbelievable soul within them. And the soul is like fire. And each and every one of us has potential, positive fire, of course. And each and every one of us has unbelievable potential. 99% of people in our generation, they don't bring their potential to the surface. Why? Because when they were kids, their parents told them, you are a loser. In school, the teacher says, you are a nobody. Society tells them, you are a, you are a nothing. So they grow up and saying, I am a nothing, I'm a loser. And, and their potential doesn't come out to the surface. We have an obligation that we have to believe as much as possible uh, in other people and to know how to arouse it. This is a very high level because I have to put my ego aside, I have to put my agenda aside, and I want to see another person succeed. Most people, they want to see another person fail. They can't stand it when somebody else succeeds. This is a very, a very pure character trait to see, no, I want to see you succeed. I will get my success because whatever she wants to give me. But to see another person, and this usually will come out in your kids, will come out in your spouse. I want to see my kids successful. I want to see my spouse successful. But I should also want to see you and you and everybody else successful. Even if you will become better than me. The fear of many people is they're afraid that you are going to become better than me. And then I'm going to be pushed out. So I don't want to see you successful. So I'll do whatever I can to make you fail. But here, the message that we want to get here, don't be afraid of somebody else's success. The success is coming from Hashem. If Hashem wants somebody to be a Moshe Rabbeinu, He will be a Moshe Rabbeinu. If Hashem wants somebody to be a gazillionaire, He will be a gazillionaire even if He, didn't, no, if he doesn't know how to read. The success only comes from the Kadosh Baruch If I'm jealous of somebody's success, this is a borderline of idol worship. Well, you don't believe that Hashem is the one who made that person successful? I need to develop, this is what the Torah is trying to teach me, develop the desire to see somebody else successful and nourish it and believe in that person and strengthen that person. You can do it. I know you can do it. Whether the challenge right now is to build up a business, whether your challenge is to overpower uh, your problem with anger or your problem with the jealousy, whatever it is. A lot of people when they deal with a challenge with their spouse, they right away run out for a divorce. Oh, I don't want to deal with it. Why? That's your spouse. So your spouse has a problem. Help that person. Reach out to that person. After all, Shem designed it in such of a way that you are the other half. So, and this is one example with a spouse. It can come out a lot with children. How many times you have challenges with your children? 
and instead of putting the child down, believe in the child and empower that, that flame in the child. And it sometimes all it takes is to say, I believe in you, I know you can make it. I know you have a struggle right now, I know you have a challenge, I believe you can do it. And when you put this belief in somebody else, really? You believe in me? I'll do it. If you believe in me, means somebody has a little bit of belief in me, then you inspire people. There's nothing greater than to make a person inspire. There's one thing, you know, our sages say, there's one thing with giving somebody charity. There's a, a much greater uh, action if you teach that person how to make money. Because you give a person now some charity, okay, so you fed him. But if you teach the person how to make money, now he will take care of himself. So we have to be lamplighters. We have to know that I have the potential of lighting up somebody else's soul. Even if I'm right now stuck in the mud and I'm not in such a great place. But in this world, we have to help each other. We have to help each other out of our own problems. Our sages say, en asir matir atzmo mi beta asurim. A prisoner cannot take himself out of his own cell. You have to open the door for him. So you help me, I'll help you, and together we help each other. But I have to understand that I have to see the potential in every person. Every person has unbelievable potential, and it's my jealousy that doesn't want that person to succeed. So no, 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 I don't want this person now to be successful. He'll take the attention off me. Now suddenly I'm not going to look so good if that person is, is successful. But the Torah is coming to teach me, put your ego aside. After all, we're all one big team here. When you are successful, I benefit from that. So I need to know how to look at every individual, find the positive flame, the potential in them, and to know how to inspire them. And sometimes all it takes is to say, I believe in you. But you really have to believe in that person. If the person went over and over and over and over and still failed, that's a whole different thing. But at least give that person a chance. And again, this can be applied with my wife, can be applied with my kids, can be applied with my friends, business partners, whatever, whatever it is. But I have the control in somebody else's life success. And you know what? Don't be afraid for somebody else to be successful that it will push you out of the, the spotlight. You want somebody else to be successful. That's how you're going to gain your success. Because when you know how to apply that, this unconditional love for somebody else, they'll be successful in their way. Kadosh Baruch is going to make you successful in your way. And it's not about who's more successful. We all have to shine in our own way. And this is what the parasha is trying to teach me. A, don't get upset. Anger is devastating. Anger is detrimental. It's, it's going to ruin everything. And you're the one who's going to suffer from that. This is message number one. But more than that, how powerful my message is to other people. Sometimes all it takes is for me to go and say, I know you can do it. No, I will fail the test. You are going to do it. And you know what? Oh, my father believes in me. So I will do it. So sometimes that's all it takes. And when you know how to do that, A, you are empowering everybody around you. Which is nothing, there's nothing greater than that. To make sure that you are giving hope to other people, empowering other people, inspiring other people. There's nothing greater than that. But more than that, the one who gains the most is yourself. Because when everybody's successful around you, you're also going to get your success exactly how it needs to be dressed in nature. Bezrat Hashem, we should apply that in our life and to know how to live by that. And needless to say how we make the world a much, much, much better place to live in. A beautiful, restful, successful, inspiring week.